So, um, so it's a great uh, pleasure for me too to be with you all. Um, this is a great conversation, and uh, I think some really interesting points have been made already. Particularly, I think Pablo hit the nail right on the head in his opening comments that the big issue is uh, in, in policy communications is about dealing with uncertainty and, and the, the pictures he put up showed the sort of the massive presence of uncertainty. Things keep changing on us uh, at incredible speeds. Um, Thomas also emphasized uh, a lot of um, how dealing with um, changing circumstances and, and many possibilities is, is a real issue. So this um, is, uh, in fact, what I'm going to talk about is exactly the subject, but I'll do it by taking us back to uh, some history in New Zealand and thinking about the development of um, the publication of Ford Policy Paths, which has been there in New Zealand since 1970, uh, 1997. Um, Doug, if you can move the slide on one, um, that'd be great. Yep. Um, you're dating actually, uh, Doug, at your, um, the picture you put up right early on was 1998, which I think is a little bit late, 1997 was when I first met Doug and some colleagues uh, that came to New Zealand to help us develop a replacement for a model which we had, which was hardly a model, it was a collection of equations, which um, were all focused on the flows and there was no accumulation of flows into stocks. There was no long-term stock equilibrium. It was just a, um, a bit embarrassing in terms of a policy model. So we wanted to um, introduce a long-term stock equilibrium, stock flow consistency, uh, expectations, and so on. We hadn't realized, I don't think, when uh, wanting this, that we, we, need, we would need policy rules to close the model on the fiscal side and the monetary policy side. But of course, uh, Doug and his um, colleagues probably knew that. But we, we, we needed to introduce a policy reaction function. We needed an endogenous policy. Um, we became aware of that, and then later in the development process, we became aware of something which was, again, a surprise to us, but probably Doug was already on top of this question, uh, what to do in the policy communications, because we had already, we had always um, communicated in a very traditional way, what would happen to inflation if uh, policy didn't change. Now, when you um, start trying to put that kind of scenario into a forward-looking model with uh, expectations, basically asking, what if you saw a, a shock to inflation and then the, the policy maker decided not to change interest rates despite seeing inflation accelerating away? Well, agents would learn that the policy maker had given up the game and the acceleration process would be even sharper. So, could we possibly um, present forecasts which were generated with that sort of constraint on policy making, uh, tuning off the endogenous policy reaction function? Well, it didn't seem reasonable. And the, the first, this is the first uh, central bank governor running an inflation targeting policy. And he just said, look, we, we cannot stand up and say, um, look, here's a forecast of inflation accelerating away from our target, but just ignore that inflation uh, projection because we'll do something about it, but we won't tell you what we'll do about it in terms of how much we'll shift interest rates. It, it, it just didn't seem like a reasonable, to him, a reasonable way of communicating. We could, of course, do the um, what was traditional at the time uh, and cheat, uh, which is to say, um, just assume that inflation would somehow be corrected by itself, or there would be a policy reaction, but we wouldn't uh, display the policy reaction. Um, but that didn't, wasn't consistent with the kind of open and transparent approach which we were adopting. So the decision was taken to publish the forward track. Uh, the idea of shaping expectations was not the driver. It came from the, this question of 
uh, being consistent with the inflation targeting objective. We're trying to sell the point that we were there to, to keep inflation under control and to then publish forecasts of inflation going out of control was just not consistent with uh, that messaging. Now, you might be able to see some connections to inflation expectations in there, but that was not the driving force to try and to shape or to mold the expectations of inflation. There was a concern at the time about whether markets might take a forward track as some kind of a commitment. We're worried a bit about that. Uh, you can see a lot of, of the discussion at the monetary policy in the monetary policy statement, which announced the new approach, and then the in the press conference, which was associated with that. A lot of discussion about uh, things will change. This will not. Uh, we will need to respond differently, and so on. In the event. Commitments, excess commitment uh, was not a problem. We had plenty of unexpected events come along pretty quickly. The equity market meltdown with the tech stock bubble bursting, the Asian financial crisis, a lot of things came along and showed that uh, we would have to change the forward outlook as circumstances changed. This showed, in fact, that we had a pretty poor handle on the future of the economy. Uh, and um, that uh, is or even before we get to the GFC, get to the European debt crisis, before we get to the collapse in global inflation, before we get to the uh, collapse in the world real interest rate, before we get to the disappearance of the link between between um, capacity utilization and inflation, before we get to the COVID shock. This was in the days of the great moderation. We already had uh, a great difficulty in forecasting inflation. Since these massive events have come along, it's become even more um, difficult to forecast inflation. The, the neat result of all this is that markets quickly learned to ignore the projected policy rate track when pricing the medium term or the longer end of the yield curve. Uh, so no commitment problem, that's the good news, uh, but not much guiding of inflation expectations either. Possibly some loss of credibility. If you stand up there and say, uh, we're a forward-looking inflation targeting, inflation forecast targeting central bank, that language, the Svensson language is not quite used, but that was the sense we were conveying. And then not being able to forecast inflation, um, there's a potential loss of, of um, credibility in that, but the loss of credibility would have been much greater had it not been the case that inflation stayed well under control through the entire period. We were constantly forecasting problems which didn't actually arrive. That said, as time goes by and you continue to present forecasts of inflation which are not realized and forecast of the policy track conditional on that inflation problem which doesn't emerge or an inflation problem does emerge and you have not forecast it, there is a potential for losing credibility. Now, the Fed has been um, a pretty um, pretty heavily by criticism of its inflation forecasting. Now, it's a, it's a, global, um, a global concern. Uh, everybody um, has the same problem. Um, the, the pictures that Pablo put up uh, early on, the discussion that we, got, we heard from Thomas, they're uh, uh, reinforcing uh, this issue that we, we um, have a great deal of difficulty in uh, selling a consistent and simple message about the policy process, the forward-looking policy process, when we base the, um, the, the presentation around forecasts of inflation. Now, note the Fed strategy change has taken this conclusion um, into, uh, into um, not an extreme, but uh, it's taken a long way forward. So part of the Fed strat new strategy is a commitment to no longer be preemptive in inflation uh, control in terms of setting interest rates. They're no longer going to uh, base uh, interest rate setting around a forecast of inflation. 
inflation. Now, this is a fairly radical departure uh, from where inflation um, targeting has been uh, in recent times. What does all this mean for forward-looking policy making? Um, well, what I think it means is that we need to shift, and, and here I'm going to try and start providing a bit of an answer to um, Pablo's um, kind of request for answers to the uncertainty problem and, and communications. I think we need to shift into uh, in two directions. First, to take far more seriously than we have been policy making as a risk minimization exercise. Thomas talked about the risk minimization uh, focus in, in decision making. To take that far more seriously uh, would mean, uh, in my view, dropping forecasts, dropping central forecasts out of the picture and replacing those entirely by discussion of policy reactions to different circumstances that could arise. Now, at any point in time, there are a number of alternative paths that the economy could take, and we're aware of many of the alternative paths, not all of them, but we're aware of many of the alternative paths. If we present um, the scenarios and the policy response, which would be consistent with those scenarios, then I think we'd start uh, heading down a track where forward-looking policy would make um, uh, much more or much more emphasis on the nature of the policy reaction function. What we'll be doing is taking Pablo's um, spreadsheets, uh, spreadsheet engine, which is available to, uh, to markets for them to play with scenarios and do that for them, at least for the two or the four or the six scenarios that we think are the most relevant ones to be thinking about at this point in time. Emphasizing that we would be changing uh, the policy path as these uh, alternative um, stories played out or these alternative narr narratives played out, emphasizing the commitment to inflation control, emphasizing that the policy reaction function or the policy preferences could lead to interest rates moving quite substantially or could lead them, lead them to them staying relatively stable. So the shift in emphasis um, towards the, um, the, the, the policy reaction function, the objectives of policy and away from a specific future, which we don't know. So let me leave it at that. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, before we turn it over uh, to the audience, um, I want to uh, try to pull things together a little bit, okay? Because these guys said some things, and uh, I want to I want to focus in on a on a question, and then refer back to some of the things that they said and and why they're so important, okay? So let's suppose I'm out there in the audience, and I'm thinking about maybe uh, publishing uh, that path. Uh, for the policy rate. And I think it's really important to understand the history behind these, these central banks. For example, New Zealand, which was the first one to publish, they had a governor decision maker. So the governor could just delegate all the technical aspects of creating the forecast to, to people. And at the end of the day, he chose the policy and he communicated the policy and the other people would be helping them to do that. In today's world, we tend to have monetary policy uh, committees, and that creates some interesting challenges. Uh, for example, uh, Pablo said that it's very important to think about monetary policy not as a path for the interest rate, but a commitment to adjust that path in response to information. And he's trying to think about ways of communicating uncertainty so that financial markets can learn about how the central bank is going to uh, be adjusting that path in response to new information about economic uh, developments and so on. And so I think that's, that's, that's very, very important uh, because if you are considering uh, publishing the path, I've strong, strongly been an advocate, uh, I would not have that path be the path that's chosen by the policymakers. 
Okay, I think that there would be big problems if you tried to do that. It takes time uh, to do what, what Thomas was talking about earlier in terms of constructing this forecast in August of 2008. And I would not want to think of policymakers uh, thinking about the path of the policy rate. I would want them to be advised by a very capable staff, very experienced staff, that had a, a long history of doing this kind of thing, thinking through these uncertainty issues. And so that's why in the, in the preamble of the inflation report, which I complained about for years, uh, Thomas will testify to that, um, it has a statement that the forecast is drawn up by the Monetary Policy Department. It is an important input of monetary policy, but it's not the only input. Okay, and in the, so the way to think about transparency in the Czech National Bank is really simple. Uh, they encourage a lively debate among the staff to think about those risk assessments, and they encourage a lively and active debate among the policymakers uh, to think about those issues. They take as input that staff debate and discussion, and then the policymakers. Uh, communicate and debate about what their own particular views are. Now, what's transparency in that world? It's just describing what's happening. <laughs> and so in that sense, it's, it's the simplest form of, of communications. You're just describing the reality of that situation. The problem is that if the policymakers get into uh, the business of trying to produce that path. Just think if it takes you know, two or three weeks to do this in a consistent way. Think of something happening a day or two before uh, the Monetary Policy Committee. Are they going to be able to fix that forecast so that it truly reflects a consensus view? That's one point. Second point, which would hark back to Bowder's uh, uh, ideas about what the role of that of those decision makers are, it's to have a thorough discussion of the uncertainties. Um, and they are acting as a group and they're also acting as individuals uh, in the case of the Czech Republic. So I'd like to just go one by one, um, starting uh, with Pablo uh, to ask, uh, is this how he thinks about it? Or, or would he elaborate on that and maybe uh, try to answer the question to someone thinking out there, if I was going to do it, I have a monetary policy committee, how would I do it? Why would I do it a particular way? So, <laughs> well, we've discussed this many times, but uh, I think the institutional setting and sort of the, the traditions in the country and the culture determine a bit how to do this. Um, in, a, in a tradition of civil service, like in the Anglo-Saxon world where the minister is sort of politically appointed and then you have the civil service that is permanent and advises. I think this idea of having a board that delegates the construction of the forecast to the staff is something that can be done and can be easily communicated. Um, but it, but the, the Latin American tradition is, is slightly different. So we have this view that the, the authority is the one in charge and it would be very odd for the governor to say, oh, you know, all this to tell the Senate, you know, all, all these forecasts we're doing, I mean, we didn't really, it doesn't, we don't really believe in them, right? It's just something that the staff provided. That would be very odd. It would be very odd to, to say that. Uh, and and uh, as a matter of fact, when we started with the monetary policy report, it was a, it was a forceful discussion and decision that the, the, the monetary policy report and the forecast is owned by the board. Right, which meant that we've had these debates internally on, on how, to inter how to introduce, for instance, endogenous monetary policy. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about how to do that. Uh, now, we've come to this corridor by the recognition that of exactly what you say, that it's, this, it's a fool's errand to try to vote on a consensus path. That would be, that would be a, a monumental waste of time. Um, so we, we tell the staff, to come up with reasonable alternatives for the for scenarios and also reasonable alternatives for the policy path that can lead to the same forecast. And this gives, uh, gives, gives, uh, leads me to a, 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 sl a slightly different issue, but that is very, very relevant 
in terms of communication, which is technically, technically, it is very easy to substitute monetary policy in the future for monetary policy today. So you can always say, oh, I'm going to hike a bit less now in exchange of hiking a bit more tomorrow or vice versa. It's very easy to, to, to say that. But the, the key is that sometimes when there is a, 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 a sort of a doubt about the credibility or the commitment, the credibility of the central bank or the commitment to inflation targeting, uh, it makes a lot of difference. And those areas of timing, if you want, of within this sort of broad uh, spectrum of options, whether to move fast at the beginning and slower later, that is something that clearly goes down to the, the, the board's judgment. Okay, so within the menu of alternatives, uh, as you see now, we're moving sort of in the, in the, in the upper part. And we, we in, in, it's very interesting to know that we, we did surprise the market with a strong hike in uh, the last point of meeting and the previous one as well. And the last one also was, was very substantial, 125 basis points. And amazingly, the long end of the yield curve has tanked, has dropped like 50 basis points. Uh, so these are the type of things that the models cannot tell you or this technical stuff cannot tell you. Right, and it, it it boils down then to the judgment of the of the board, who are the responsible in, terms, in the face of the public, uh, to to do the policy that they think is appropriate for for enhancing the credibility of of the of the of the framework. So, um, going back to the beginning, I, I, it is it is harder maybe for us because we cannot give this step of of telling the staff come up with a forecast and we'll just use it as an input. Uh, we need to publicly be accountable for the whole, mm -hmm. which is, is a bit of a, an extra challenge. So Pablo, I think you've raised an excellent point here about, about uh, how independent is the staff in terms of constructing this forecast. It's a, it's a perfect question. Uh, the way Governor Tuba described this to me, he said, uh, that's what the text says, but if you look at that top, it has a uh, it has a logo that says Czech National Bank, and I'm governor of the Czech National Bank. So I want to move on to to Thomas here. Uh, usually, the way it's organized in a central bank is that somebody on the MPC is also playing the role, okay, of coordinating the information flow uh, with the staff. And so I'd like to move to. Uh, so you're absolutely right, Pablo. I agree entirely that. You can't just have a, a completely independent staff. There has to be good communications, you know, back and forth. Thomas, uh, could you explain how this is done uh, at the Czech National Bank, please? Yes, and this is a very good point. We have had many debates on this. And uh, the fact is that uh, publicly we label the forecast as the CNB forecast. It's owned by the institution and uh, to the extent that the board is the top management of the bank, uh, of course, we take responsibility for it as managers of the institution. And uh, we need to make sure that we have the best forecasting team in the country. That's our responsibility, which also means that we cannot be systematically uh, dissatisfied with the forecasting uh, output of of our staff, we need to trust them and, and we need to communicate that uh, we appreciate the work that they are doing and, and that more or less we are fine with it. But it doesn't mean that as policymakers, because we have a dual role, we are managers, but also policymakers. So as policymakers, uh, we can in any meeting deviate from the forecast or make reservations to the forecast because that's our job. Um, the value added of the board on top of what the staff does, it's the risk assessment, the discussion of uncertainties. And also here I agree fully with uh, I, the idea of uh, David that uh, we need to do a kind of risk, ma risk management approach. And this aspect comes to the forefront, especially in extremely uncertain situations. And, and COVID crisis was a situation which 
we were not able to perfectly model with any of our <clears throat> tools. It was unprecedented. No one, uh, the shock was non-economic. No one knew how it would develop in the future. So, so we started to forecast, uh, sorry, to highlight in the communication a lot of the risk and uncertainty. And the new aspect, that I would say, that appeared in our uh, public, even public communication was acknowledging that we are most likely to make a policy error. We don't know the future. <laughs> uh, the world is so uncertain that no matter what we do, there is a risk that uh, it will prove to be wrong exposed. But we are discussing what will, what will be uh, the, a, a potentially bigger error. Uh, and, and this is very important relative to the pace of policy moves, uh, the timing, etc. So here I fully agree with Pablo. You need to leave it up to the book <laughs> to take the forecast, but to put the policy considerations on top of it and, and to decide. And as I say, originally we viewed as a bigger policy error to start policy normalization in a premature way and then see that uh, the COVID crisis is still with us, that there might be some deflation risk, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we delayed the policy normalization, but currently, with the knowledge about the health situation and also the stagflationary impacts uh, of uh, the lockdowns, we see as a bigger risk not to act because uh, if inflation expectations be become de-anchored and, and they start to systematically exceed our target, it might be very costly in the future to bring inflation back to the target. So, also, this risk management point of view evolves over time, and then sometimes you you may deviate from the forecast more than in other situations. If if the times are calm, you more or less may follow uh, the forecast like um, more mechanically, uh, but in uncertain periods, uh, you need to really discuss a lot uh, the policy aspects. Thanks. So. So thank you uh, very much, Thomas. Um, David, uh, your uh, last uh, point in this in this slide um, might actually have a solution to some of the problems that we're uh, that we're facing now. Maybe you could uh, comment on this issue that we're talking about here and how you think uh, pr having the staff produce uh, more. Um, of uh, these scenarios uh, are gonna are gonna help improve communicating monetary policy. Yeah, so I think Thomas has just uh, articulated it in terms of going through the tensions uh, one faces as a policymaker in a situation like early in the COVID, late in the COVID, where we are now. There are just so many big possibilities. Uh, it's certainly. Um, not at all true that the uh, sorts of rapid changes in, scenario, in, in situation that we're currently seeing, uh, Pablo's um, policy corridors, three of them in a row almost not overlapping at all, uh, moving dramatically uh, away from each other, the sorts of uh, very rapid takeoffs that Thomas was, was talking about. These these um, situations were certainly uh, understood as real possibilities, but the other possibilities which worried us terribly as policymakers were the sorts of things which stopped us reacting preemptively. Now, to try and get those messages across about the tensions, the genuine tensions that come from this radical uncertainty, a term that Kate and King are used, are using, I think it's exactly right. The tensions that come for policymakers from this radical uncertainty are best conveyed to the public through narratives. Here's what could happen. It could be that we're going to get, a, we've had a lot of policy stimulus, a lot of fiscal policy stimulus, a lot of monetary policy stimulus, huge amounts of, of M2, whatever uh, money you want to, the count being injected in, 
uh, a massive um, overhang of, of uh, demand, latent demand, which could spark in the context of continued supply constraints coming from all the tensions and, the, and, and, and supply chains and so on. That could create a huge problem. Then on the other side, you've got um, um, the inflation's been on the floor. It's been it's been just completely non-reactive to uh, to capacity utilization uh, developments. Uh, there's uh, the Delta variant. There's a whole lot of things which could leave us uh, with a, a, a tip back towards deflation. Now. Uh, these are these are massive tensions. Now, to tell the story of those tensions through narrative scenarios, policy mm -hmm. scenarios, without saying, and here is the preferred middle path, where we say this is the most likely, which does not make sense because we do not know which of those are most likely. We are genuinely completely uncertain about which is most likely. What we want to convey is. Whichever of those happens, we are going to respond appropriately. And by appropriately, we mean consistent with the objectives we've been given. And this is what we mean when we say that. Here's what would happen to interest rates if the Delta variant continued to kill the economy, closures continued, and so on and so forth. Here's what we mean if we had to start responding to a really sharp takeoff on inflation. Uh, that seem to be spilling over into private expectations. So we're going to take the, we're going to take a policy path which emphasizes whichever one we think we want to emphasize most. Uh, if we think that the um, uh, tipping into re-entering re a deflationary mode would be the most dangerous of these two, you might want to convey a policy story about taking insurance against that particular scenario. In which case the discussion would be not about, this is the most likely path, this is why we're reacting this way, but it's about, here's the balancing of risks. These are the risks we're most concerned about. That's why we are leaning in this direction. In terms, just to finish quickly, the, the, the discussion in the policy committee, given such scenarios, I think is not a problem. The reason it's not a problem is these scenarios are going to encompass the range of policymaker views. Nobody has to agree on what is the right way of representing the economy, what is the right representation of shocks in the process currently, what's the right path for the policy rate in the future. You don't have to agree on that because there are many alternatives that you're talking to the public about. <laughs> What you have to agree on is the risk management strategy to adopt. And that's an easier discussion. It's not an easy discussion, but it's an easier discussion. Thank you. Um, so now it's time um, for comments and, uh, and questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so I would, I would ask you to uh, turn your video on, raise your hand, and, and then I will, uh, I will respond to that. Uh, so, Ernesto, could you please proceed? Thank you so much for the uh, very interesting discussion by, by the panel. I have a question to, to the whole panel, actually. Uh, it's an implementation issue that I could foresee uh, about the corridor or the fan charts as a communication tool that maybe may be relevant uh, nowadays, which is, suppose that there is some let's say catastrophic, maybe not catastrophic, so, but possible outcome that the staff and the board uh, foresee. But uh, communicating that uh, possibility has some issues because then it has to explain uh, why the central bank is foreseeing that extreme possibility. Probably that's going to call the attention of the press. That is going to be in the headlines. And one thing is communicating to the financial sector and experts. Another thing is communicating to households and firms, which may be may overweight these uh, headlines uh, in the in the press about this catastrophic event. So, in, in some sense, it would be like a central bank pushing the economy closer to the cliff uh, instead of trying to get uh, away from it. 
Then, but then that won't be included in the corridor or in the fan charts. And if that scenario sort of materializes, then we'll see that the policy rate will be out of the corridor of the fan charts. And if on the top of that, the situation is becomes worse and worse, then we'll see consistently the uh, actions of the central bank being a way uh, of this corridor. And then the question is, well, if we suppose that the corridor captures policy path in the, let's say the 90% of possibilities, and now the central bank is acting out of the corridor in a consistent way for some time, then is this really, shall we trust in the corridor or not? Uh, and is in that sense, is the corridor going to be an effective tool mm -hmm. of communication or not? So that's the question. So that's that's a very good question. And I'd actually like to go back to start with New Zealand in this case. Uh, the way the way it was explained to me was this way, Ernesto. Uh, the Reserve Bank is right on the fault, a fault, an earthquake fault. And, and the idea is they used to have like a, a, a bunch of caveats and so on uh, that would say, you know, if this happens, it's a, you know, we'll say this. And I think if, if basically there's an earthquake, uh, everybody would know that, that you probably uh, are not maybe going to follow the, the corridor. Okay. And the problem with adding caveats is that the list gets long and then, then the message becomes blurrier. But David, do you, maybe you can comment on that a bit. One precision though, uh, when I said catastrophic event, I did not mean a for, an unforecastable uh, catastrophic event. I meant an economic event that probably the central bank could have access or anyone like, with the data could have uh, a yeah. sense that may happen. So a good example is seeds of a financial yeah, so there's so. That would be a financial crisis which is breaking or a COVID crisis which is breaking. I mean, we, we had at the beginning of the COVID crisis um, a, a very wide range of possibilities in front of us. Either it was going to um, uh, snap back pretty quickly and we, if we poured a massive amount of uh, stimulus in, that could create an inflation problem we had to really get a hold of. Or, Alternatively, the, locks, the lockdowns, the closure of economies, the collapse in global trade and so on could have continued uh, with, remember we had 20% uh, unemployment rates forecast by Federal Reserve banks. Um, so to, to um, come up with a, a, a drastic forecast like that, um, I don't think uh, there's some possibility it might scare people into acting as if this was the outlook. But it, I think in the context of um, uh, sort of a, a realism in the discussion that you're having with the community, this is unlikely to be, cause a problem. In fact, I think it's the other way around. To, to kind of pretend that the world is very certain uh, as... Uh, Central banks, which are driven to try and find a consensus view to convey with one voice across all of these policy makers in a world where there's absolutely no way that you can have that degree of certainty, that's the more dangerous game to play with public. Uh, Pablo, did you want to take a stab or Thomas? Sure. Um, so, any any relation to reality is coincidental, right, Ernesto? <laughs> so but the same I, thing would apply I think to there are two, there are two ways or some other stuff. It doesn't there, have to. I think there are two. There are two ways to address this issue. One is uh, uh, that the 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 width of the corridor uh, in some way reflects uh, scenarios that are spelled out in the monetary policy report. So they. There is a sort of a, a, a rough, a rough description of what is what are the scenarios that can lead you to be within the corridor, and also what are the scenarios that might lead you out of the corridor, right? Now, uh, so what 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 we, which things can lead you out? I think within the realm of the possibility, not the earthquake, right? But uh, it's I think we try to make an effort of of being relatively clear. The second thing is that there is no, there are no bands outside of the corridor. 
right? There's, there are no policy. So you, you, you are not saying what you will do if events kick you out of the corridor. <clears throat> and that is an important degree of, of freedom because, because the, the events can be so large and so strange that uh, 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 you may you may have to to react in a, in, a, in, a, in a peculiar way. So, I think the fact that there is no that you that we communicate roughly what are the the, 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 the things that can happen that can kick kick us out, but we don't say what is the specific things that we would do. I think is useful. The second aspect that I think is relevant is this is this is the multi voice report. It's not the financial stability report. Uh, because I think the challenge on, on financial instability is much tougher uh, because of the likelihood of multiple equilibrium runs uh, in, in, in leverage institutions. So that discussion, I think, is still, you know, has needs to be educated. This, mm -hmm. There's no clear way to address an imminent situation of financial instability in a leveraged institution that can create sort of spillover effects on the system and where to be clear or, 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 or not clear or transparent or transparent, that, that is something that is still work in progress in the profession, I think it's. And finally, I, I think it is interesting to, to, be, to, to, to be aware that, you, that one as a central bank needs to calibrate the message through different vehicles to the different audiences. So, uh, because it could be perfectly the case, as you mentioned, that the message that is uh, delivered to the financial system can be misinterpreted in the political world or in the, 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 in the broad public. So the, once we communicate, you need to be able to communicate at the same time through channels with messages that are tailored to the different audiences, which means that the communications area has a lot of work, right? <laughs> which is fine. Mm -hmm. So Ernesto, uh, what, what I was trying to say is that caveats don't work. You raise a very important question. And for those central banks like the Czech National Bank, where they do both conventional monetary policy and financial stability. Um, so I think Thomas is in a very unique uh, uh, position because he has to wear two hats. And so maybe we can, we can, we can ask him uh, how, how he wears those hats differently when he thinks about financial stability versus conventional monetary policy. Yeah, it's true. Uh, we have both the monetary policy and financial stability mandate. And of course, the mindset, uh, it's different in financial stability. When setting macro prudential policy, you focus more on tail risks and you try to preempt not the bad scenarios, but uh, institutions going bankrupt when the bad scenarios arrive. While for monetary policy, we usually focus on the likely outcomes and we communicate that the fan charts that we publish, they more or less cover the, the standard degree of uncertainty, uh, like in normal times, they don't capture all possible tail risks. And for the tail risk analysis, uh, we can of course use scenarios, uh, which uh, show very, sometimes they may show very significant differences from, from the baseline projections. Uh, and the most extremes of those scenarios are the ones that we are using in stress testing of financial institutions. And based on the, the results of those stress tests, we, we are setting capital requirements and stuff like that. So really the mindset of the two policies are different and, and the toolboxes are different, but still we believe that it's good to have them in one institution because uh, you can at least to some extent uh, coordinate the two areas or to take into account the interactions between the two. So thank you, uh, Ernesto. That was an amazing uh, question about potential limits of transparency or just trying to be intelligible to explain uh, these really complex uh, issues. We have another uh, comment question. Looks like from Shelva. Uh, could you go ahead, please, Shelva? And could you turn your video on? Or I don't see you. There you are. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the very insightful discussion. So my question uh, is about the uh, what you think about the 
balance between the risks and benefits of uh, uh, publishing the policy rate paths uh, and let me give you a little background of uh, how I uh, approach this uh, issue. So one of the risks that uh, you have mentioned is the is this uh, fear of commitment that the market may uh, misrepresent the intentions of central banks and uh, may not understand the conditional nature of the forecast. But uh, as the experience uh, had show, uh, shows, uh, at least uh, of, of those couple of countries that have published the other policy rate paths, this is probably not a big concern. In case of Georgia as well, uh, we have started publishing the policy rate paths uh, in uh, 2016. And since then, uh, uh, my impression is that uh, there was no major concern from the financial markets uh, complaining that the central bank is not, is not following the policy rate paths that, has, that they have published previously. So they, uh, I would say they understand this uh, perfectly that the forecasts are of conditional nature. So to my uh, mind, that, that, that is a one risk less uh, uh, that, that is associated with the publishing policy rate path. And on the benefit side, I think there is a one benefit more, which is some, sometimes overlooked, at least uh, that's my impression. And uh, it's one thing that the publishing policy rate paths actually help us in uh, communicating the intentions of, of central bank, at least within the baseline scenario. And uh, this helps us in managing the short term interest rate expectations, which has its effect on the long term interest rate uh, expectation interest rates. Uh, but there is another channel through which the publishing policy rate path could probably help us uh, in making monetary policy more uh, efficient or effective, and that is the uh, term premium uh, channel going through the term premium. And uh, my view on that is uh, that this could probably result in lower uh, term premium because when the central banks publish policy rate paths, they essentially tell the complete market picture uh, that they uh, think is the baseline scenario for the economy going forward. And uh, this could actually lower the interest rate risk. And, and let, let me uh, give the simple example. For example, if the central bank is forecasting that inflation will decline uh, in the future, this can have uh, two implications how market actually sees the interest rates going forward. One scenario is that it's the central bank that, that's uh, intending to increase the policy rate. And this is what brings inflation down in the forecast horizon. That's one scenario. The, the, another scenario is that it's something else that brings inflation down. And the implication for central bank is that they will reduce the policy rate. So inter, uh, inflation going down in the forecast horizon can have both implications for policy rate. Market may think that it may, may, might increase or it might decrease. So when we communicate the policy rate paths, uh, this actually reduces the interest rate risk at least uh, this uh, clarifies how the central bank sees the complete market picture. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, what is your experience uh, with this? Uh, have you noticed uh, uh, such declines in the term premia or the flattening of the yield curve uh, when the, your central banks have started publishing policy rate paths? And um, as a background, uh, let me give you Georgian experience. In our case, when we started in 2016, publishing these policy rate paths, uh, this was a time when the central bank uh, started uh, easing policy, uh, monetary policy, and uh, start, uh, started to reduce policy rates and communicated that uh, in the forecast horizon, policy rates would decline by about, by about uh, 150 basis points. But uh, if you look at the uh, long-term interest rates, the yield curve flattened significantly. Uh, not only short-term rates declined, but the long-term rates declined twice as much as the short-term rates. So uh, the way we have uh, uh, when we analyzed this, uh, it, it looked like the, the other half, uh, the decline in the long-term rates was associated with the decline in the liquidity and the interest rate risk or term premium. And if this is indeed uh, more like a universal channel that the publishing policy rate paths uh, can work through, isn't this an additional benefit that could potentially tip the balance in favor of uh, for other central banks to follow this approach and publish the policy rate paths. So um, who wants to take a, a stab at that? Pablo or? Sure. Uh, so, uh, well, we don't know if it has any, when we started, I, we don't know if it started having an effect because it was right when the pandemic uh, commenced. So. 
it's there were so many things happening that it's it's very hard to disentangle the effect of the publication from the, all the unconventional measures that we did. However, uh, my sense is that the financial markets haven't really cared about this. This has been much more useful for a different audience, journalists and the political world, <laughs> because those are the most likely to ask you for explanations if you do something different from what you said you were going to do, or to ask you for clear answers about what is coming in the future. Uh, without having a policy path, uh, we would just go around in circles trying to answer these difficult questions. But with the corridor, uh, with the corridor we have now, uh, we say, well, just look at the corridor, right? That's a, a very straightforward, simple answer that uh, gives us a, a, a significant freedom to get out of those type of, of, of discussions, which were very common. So how many times are you going to hike over the next six months? Two times, three times, four times, right? And uh, you said you're going to do it three times and now you did it only once, what happened, right? So this type of discussions have in some ways stopped. So it's not the financial markets, but our journalists, the press, and the political world. And, uh, and I think has been a, a welcome change in, in, in the substance of the debate. Thomas? Yeah, quick comment from me. Um, the, the experience, I think, of many countries starting off with inflation and targeting, um, and this, I know the question was about publishing for rates, uh, not inflation targeting per se, but I'll get there. The experience of when studying inflation targeting was um, to see a, a, a remarkable drop in longer term interest rates um, as the people learned that there was a there was a new game in town that there was a new there was a new objective of monetary policy a new target for the monetary policy makers. Now, if the um, in New Zealand, that, that happened early, uh, much earlier than the beginning of publishing of the forward tracks. The publishing of forward tracks itself did not seem to have any effect on term premia. If the process of publishing a forward track is somehow seen as a part of the process of the change in the policy objective, then there is a possibility that you're going to see um, a shift in, the, in, in term premia apparently associated with the publication of forward tracks, but actually associated with the uh, re the new discipline in, in the monetary policy process. Um, so, um, shall we move on or uh, no further reactions to those, uh, to those comments? Uh, so, so I'm, I'm struck, I mean, we're, we're we seem to be uh, saying that the role of the forecast is to communicate stories about uncertainty, okay? And and it seems to me that there's a big risk then if we pretend that the policymaker is 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 actually setting that path because that that I so I like what Chile has done, you know, with this with this corridor uh, this corridor thing, uh, but I'd like to. Uh, ask people to uh, reflect on what that means. Um, like, so it sounds like David, he wants us to produce scenarios so that uh, the staff the staff present these scenarios maybe in an appendix at the back of the monetary policy report, David. And, and then there, there continues to be a simple description of, of how they're using that analysis. Um, and then people can mentally kind of assign probabilities to uh, the different ingredients that go into this uh, this scenario. Uh, does that make sense, uh, uh, Pablo and and Thomas and Shelva as well? You're 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 still here. Uh, would the monetary policy report just get too complicated by by you know putting all these scenarios in it? Um, or, or do you think that this is feasible to actually implement in practice? So in our case, we, we, we actually thought about doing exactly that, uh, of, of not only showing the corridor, but all the lines that are within the corridor with the different scenarios. Now we decided against it uh, because again, for instance, one scenario could be 
oh, fiscal policy is more expansionary, right? It takes one year longer to reach the structural target. And point mm -hmm. of diversity rate will have to be, let's say, 50 basis points higher than. Uh, that can be a, a sort of a misleading message on both sides because it, it might be because you cannot you cannot describe all the contingencies that are behind that. You are coming up with sort of a one example of a fiscal policy that is different from what has been announced, right? Uh, but there can be so many of those that the message can be totally misinterpreted. For instance, the press can say central bank threatens to rise interest rates by 50 basis points if the Congress goes to expansionary on the budget. So th that's a headline we don't want to have, right? Uh, because, because it could be that it's not 50, it's 150. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's nothing, right? So it, it can again deviate the discussion towards the specifics of each scenario um, and not the actual judge, uh, uh, the actual uh, 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 sort of intuition and judgment that the board will uh, have to deploy when reacting to the, 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 the sort of the revelation of these different scenarios. So we so far we haven't we see them so that's why how we construct this thing, but so far we have decided not to publish them. But but couldn't that problem be handled like with a preamble, like a simple preamble, okay, that says that the role of the forecast is to tell us about tendencies. We so the policymaker is not we're not choosing the policy rate from that forecast or or those scenarios. What we're doing is we're saying that there's going to a tendency for maybe interest rates to rise or to fall. And that whether or not the, the, the board decides on 25 basis points now or 25 basis points three months from now, there are some other considerations uh, that go into that. So can't we kind of like disconnect that a little bit? Uh, so that I, thought you, I thought you didn't like, you didn't like the caveats. <laughs> you have to keep this simple. Like that's how it's, we, we, we figured out that the, the extent of complexity has maybe depends on the audience as well, right? On the country and the, the, the appetite for this type of complexities. And maybe we are not there yet. So before I go back to I David- I think you're totally right. The, the, the complexity, you can certainly over complexify the whole thing and trying to do, uh, we already overload our, our uh, forecasts and our monetary policy reports with all sorts of details about the forecast, much much of which are not necessary for telling the story. Just to, just to correct uh, maybe a, a misunderstanding of what I would recommend, it's not relegating scenarios to the appendices. Now, there's a lot of the various possibilities that Pablo referred to. A lot of things could happen which might have been uh, major concerns in the past that we've had, which you can collect in a series of appendices, make available to the public if people wanted to think about what would be the implications of this story unfolding. I would be putting scenarios front and center stage in the body of the report as the basis for the risk management discussion, which would be the essence of what you're conveying to the public. Now, you would choose your scenarios based on what do you think are the things which are really the most important unknowns at the moment. Now, we've got quite a few obvious ones. We're not sure if we're back into a 1970s kind of uh, world in which we're seeing a whole bunch of what might be idiosyncratic, uh, narrow set of prices jumping for particular supply reasons. Uh, with with a, a lot of those things about to turn around by themselves, or we might be seeing something um, very different where it's they're not going to turn around by themselves. There's there's not a, there is a there is a de-anchoring of inflation expectations. That's one of our big concerns. So it, that might be coupled with a, um, a shift in the um, sh the shape of the Phillips curve back to where it where it was before. So we've got two really big um, concerns uh, in terms of which way inflation is going to respond. Those would be the two scenarios which you would lay out. If there happened to be a big fiscal uncertainty, sure, you would lay out that one. But it's in the balancing of these risks and the discussion around which of those 
uh, world is most problematic in terms of non-linearities, traps, uh, dislocations, which would cost a lot of pain, economic pain to recover the situation. That's where you'll be fo focusing the discussion. One final word is when we had a discussion with governors around dealing with uh, COVID risks, um, what we found is a, is a number of central banks actually adopted exactly the strategy. They dropped their forecasts and they laid out a couple of the big scenarios and said, here's the sorts of things which could happen. Here's the path we're taking. And the path we're taking is guarding, based on guarding against the worst of those outcomes. And that seemed to work. Last point, Thomas, and then we'll yeah, go well, to the For me, um, it's still very useful to have a, a baseline forecast and uh, to supplement it with scenarios. Uh, our move from inflation report to monetary policy report, one of the differences is that we have more policy-based scenarios in the, in the new version of the report and, and discuss more the risks and uncertainties. But I think if you bring together seven policymakers and you give them uh, 10 different scenarios without telling them which one is the main tendency and which, which ones are like low probability events, the decision making would get extremely messy. So I, I, from my point of view and given my experience, uh, the baseline projection is still useful, but you need to supplement it with meaningful uh, risk and uncertainty debate. Thanks. Okay, that was that was excellent. Um, so we are going to go to the poll now, um, and but this time, uh, after uh, listening to the presentations and the discussion, uh, maybe the maybe the answers will uh, will change a little bit. Um, now, I should say that uh, that if you think that all of these things are important, uh, these uh, experts. Uh, they're from central banks that are the leading uh, central banks in terms of monetary policy transparency, uh, according to uh, according to our estimates and according to estimates by Ginter uh, and Eichen Green. Uh, so I'd like to thank them uh, before we look at these poll uh, results for such a wonderful and uh, and stimulating uh, uh, discussion. Um, so. I, I, someone's asking me what my answers are. Um, so, <clears throat> so are we going to get the answers to the poll? Yes, we're waiting for a few more people to vote and then we will display the, the answers. And then we have to break out or uh, we're holding the room up here. Or how much time? Well, the session should have started two minutes ago. So we, okay, we so will have to move very we, fast. Okay, yes. So we really, we're all waiting in anticipation. I want to see high marks for simplified central bank communications. Okay, that's what I'm hoping for here, okay? So can we just close the poll? Or I guess, did we give them a preset amount of time or something? Yeah, we said three minutes, but we're closing, okay. the, closing it now. Victor, when I can show the result. Give, a, give, give us a minute, we're about to show the results. So he's going to put up the, 
the pre and the post presentation results? That's the idea, yeah. There you go. Very good. Very good. Good result. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Sophia, for uh, all your efforts in organizing this. It's It's been great. Okay. Thanks, guys. Sure. Thanks a lot to all of you.